everybody, and welcome to this week's Cruise Chat. I'm Kathleen Penner, owner of Plenty of Sunshine Travel, and today I'm joined by Kara, and Kara is from Cork Expeditions. This is the first time I've had the pleasure to meet with her, uh, so we're going to be going over just a great brand overview and just to sort of cover what you can expect by going on their exciting expedition ships. So over to you. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking into delving into the bottom of the world and the top of the world with all of you um, today. So this is really exciting. Yeah, thank you for um, joining us. I appreciate it. So again, my name is Kara Matthew, and I have actually been with Cork Expeditions for almost 13 years now. It goes quickly, mm -hmm. uh, but I absolutely love this company and where they go and what we do. And I know that everyone from the ships, everyone working on the ships to the office and everyone in between is incredibly polar passionate. So I've been really fortunate enough to go on some of the Cork Expeditions trips. So I've been to areas like Greenland and Antarctica and also the North Pole, uh, 90 degrees north, which is very fun. So we have trips that go right to the North Pole. And what's really neat about Cork Expeditions is the fact that we've been in business for 30 years and we only do polar travel. So we don't go anywhere else uh, in the world. We're not a cruise company that dabbles a little bit in the Arctic and Antarctic. Um, we are only focused on polar travel. So we don't go anywhere else uh, in the world. So I like to think of us as uncompromisingly polar. Uh, and that's really, that's really what we do. And I feel like we're specialists in these regions. Mm -hmm. And that's really what sets us apart is being experts in, in these areas. I love that. That's great. That's super. And with not only with us being in business for 30 years, um, why people should travel with Cork Expeditions is also because we deliver these polar adventures to passengers for these 30 years, but we were actually the first company to take passengers to the North Pole in 1991. And that is still a trip that we do today. Mm -hmm. uh, we were actually led the first ever passenger transit of the Northeast Passage. So I thought that was a really um, neat tidbit of information. Mm -hmm. But also, we were the first company to bring commercial passengers on a full circumnavigation of Antarctica. So people are realizing that when they choose to travel with Cork Expeditions and choose to travel in the polar regions, they really are uh, in good hands. Mm -hmm. So when we're going in these regions, for people who aren't familiar with expeditions in the polar regions, we are actually on small little expedition ships in these areas. So the ships are our little home base for our trip. And so if people that are really into cruising love coming in these areas, but even the non-traditional cruisers, Kathleen, are very um, keen on going in these areas and being on a ship at this time because with Cork Expeditions, we're on small little expedition ships, but we're getting off the ship as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So Cork Expeditions does have the most diverse fleet of small polar ships. So none of our vessels have more than 199 passengers. And I think this is really important when people are choosing uh, a polar expedition. Uh, we do have the diverse fleet. So it also in enables everyone to kind of choose what type of ship they want to go on, whether it's our brand new ultramarine or luxurious uh, expedition vessel with two helicopters, which I'll talk about later mm -hmm. on. But we also have little nimble full expedition ships that are 128 passengers, uh, like our ocean adventurer, which I'll bring up later too. So there's a little something uh, for everyone. But do you mind if we go to the bottom of the world for a little bit Not and navigate all. a little That's bit exciting. of Antarctica? Yeah. Uh, because what I really love about Antarctica, and I love maps as well, and mm -hmm. it's so remote and it truly is at the bottom of the world. And so with traveling to Antarctica with Cork Expeditions, there's a lot to choose from. So if people are short on time, but big on adventure, we have little trips that start at eight days where we fly over um, from South America and fly over to the continent, get on the ship and then fly back after a full Antarctic expedition. Mm -hmm. But we also have trips. If people want to go a little longer, we have uh, 12 day trips, 14, all the way up to 23 days. So really depending on a, how long someone wants to go for mm -hmm. or uh, B how long people want to actually immerse themselves on the continent itself. There's a lot to choose from with cork expeditions. And because we only do polar, 
Our season actually goes from the end of October, beginning of November, mm -hmm. all the way through to the beginning of April. Mm -hmm. So Kathleen, there's lots of different dates uh, and, and times and itineraries that people can choose from. Mm -hmm. And there's no bad time to go. Um, we are going in the Antarctic summer, so it's not as cold as people think it is when we're traveling to, to the peninsula. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there is no bad time to go. It just people will see different things. For instance, the end of December is typically um, the emergence of the chicks. The chicks are starting to hatch in Antarctica on the continent itself. Mm -hmm. But in November, the beginning of the season, it's just so pristine with fresh fallen snow from coming out of the Antarctic winter. Mm -hmm. And you'll see adult penguins stealing rocks from each other's nests to build their own nests for their own <laughs> chicks. So it's really neat just the different yeah. months. You're just seeing different things. Mm -hmm. And high on my bucket list is the uh, Northern Lights. Is that something that you would find during those times? They so that's really a great question because there is a short amount of darkness when we are there, depending on, on the month that we're going. Mm. Uh, so there are times where people like we have camping experiences on some of our departures. So a lot of people enjoy camping at night and seeing the stars. Mm -hmm. We're unfortunately not going south enough um, in, the, in that time of year to be able to see a full um, the um, the southern lights mm -hmm. but we do have northern lights trips in Greenland that are phenomenal and we typically go uh, in September and early October for those mm -hmm. um, in the north which is great yeah. so exciting it is. which I'll talk about too because with the northern lights I saw them back in 2016 in Greenland and Greenland's not on a lot of people's radar so I'm really glad uh, you brought the, that up mm -hmm. but with Antarctica some fun facts it is the fifth largest continent and it's 98 percent covered in ice and it is actually twice the size of australia so i just like putting things into in perspective, perspective. Yeah. yeah that's something you can visualize so, really well so thank you yeah that's cool yeah like it was it's that it's that uh it's enormous and it's surrounded by the southern ocean Mm -hmm. So it's actually surrounded by water. So it's, a lot of people don't realize that it's a, a, a continent surrounded by completely water. Uh, so it's just a spectacular, spectacular place um, to visit. So we are crossing um, the infamous Drake Passage, Kathleen, mm -hmm. when we're going to the bottom of the world. Mm -hmm. And so because it is surrounded by water, that is another reason why we use the vessels to cross the Drake Passage. So we're leaving typically from... Uh, Ushuaia, Argentina, yeah. or we also leave for the fly cruise programs. We leave from Chile, from Punta Arenas, Chile to mm -hmm. fly over. But a lot of adventurers want that badge of honor crossing the Drake Passage. And it is quite the experience um, crossing the Drake. And it can either be the Drake Lake, we call it, and quite smooth, mm -hmm. or people can experience the Drake Shake and it can be a little bit rough. Um, so it's just part of the experience. And yeah. But I love being able to get out on deck as much as possible for, for this crossing because there are birds that we can see and possible albatross sightings because they are catching the draft of the ship and you can sometimes see uh, birds going counterclockwise uh, of the vessel itself catching the draft. So there is still lots to see and do um, on these crossings. Mm -hmm. Typically takes a day and a half to two days in each direction mm -hmm. uh, to sail. I did this crossing for the first time with my 66 year old aunt. So my aunt and I did an amazing trip together an, an aunt and niece voyage. And we had a remarkable time because she's into photography and wildlife. Uh, and so on one crossing, it was absolutely um, a little bit rough for us because we get mm -hmm. seasick. So it was fun being together and having that experience. But then on the way back, it was fine. We were out on deck a lot and and uh, and having a great experience. So it just mm -hmm. depends um, completely on, on the day of the crossing. So definitely pack some seasickness pills or that patch that you can get behind your ear. That's a good tip. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, that is yeah. that patch I definitely used mm -hmm. and it came in handy. It well. <laughs> that's a great I'm, point. I'm quite surprised how well that works. So that's good. And then with um, Antarctica is actually getting on the continent. There's a stillness and a silence that I've never experienced before in my life. So after um, arriving on the continent, after that day and a half sailing, um, it's incredibly amazing. And it was an experience that I'll never forget for my first time. And the mountain ranges and the majestic landscapes, it's just 
honestly otherworldly. It's mm -hmm. truly like you're on another planet. There's no other place in the world like it. But with having those small little expedition ships, we're able to get off the ship, everyone at the same time, mm -hmm. and actually get out onto the continent. Uh, so that is really something unique. We uh, try and get off the ship as much as possible. We're really trying to go further and farther into these regions. And so typically we'll have breakfast on board and then get off for uh, a morning excursion, mm -hmm. then get back on for, for lunch. And then we'll typically have another excursion in the afternoon, weather permitting. And then we come back and have a great recap and, uh, and dinner. Mm -hmm. But the penguins definitely are the stars of the show. Yeah. They are the main draw to Antarctica. And there are 17 species of penguins in the world. And we typically on an Antarctic voyage going to the peninsula can see about four, four species of, of penguins, depending on the trip. Uh, but we're actually going right into the rookery. So it's great to be able to walk amongst the penguins. And mm -hmm. even though we try and stay a safe distance to the penguins, yep. they are so curious. Yeah. And they'll often come right That's up awesome. to people. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> and then whales. Are you a whale um, fan, Kathleen? I am. Yeah, they're just majestic to see and oh, they're stunning. Mm -hmm. Look how close I they just are. love whales. And this is part of really what it means to be a part of an expedition is because mm -hmm. one morning we were actually supposed to be going on a landing. And I, we were in February uh, and this was the trip with my aunt, my aunt Lucy. And we were supposed to go on a landing that morning, but we came across two humpback whales, a mother and her calf. And so we stayed in a little cove um, for a couple of hours uh, with these amazing whales. And it was a magical moment. One of them went or the calf went right underneath our zodiac and popped up on the other side and it was truly a moment I will never forget it's embedded in my heart and in my travel memories yep if I could just interject that's one of the things I love about expedition cruising and small ship cruising where you can just change your itinerary on the fly it doesn't you know you don't have to be at a certain spot at a certain time but if you see something you're like okay we're just going to readjust and just get immersed in that uh experience of seeing the whales and then it means so much to the passengers too, right? Because that's something you said you'd never forget. Yeah, and I love that you said that too, because um, some people think that expedition is really might be outside of their comfort zone and might be a little bit hesitant to travel on a trip like this. Mm -hmm. uh, but it really is exactly that, um, just packing your sense of adventure because anything can happen at any moment with wildlife and, and gorgeous scenery. Uh, so that's definitely... I believe what an expedition to is all about. So there's definitely something for an active traveler and something, yep. someone that's uh, quite active and uh, wants to do a lot of that sort of hiking and, mm -hmm. and kayaking, but then it's also for a leisure traveler too. Someone who just really wants to enjoy being um, in the polar regions and looking at the ice formations and, and the mountain ranges and the wildlife as well. And this orca, um, picture this wasn't on one of my trips but uh there is a video later on that i can share with you and, and send you uh that this an orca whale was actually chasing a penguin and it was an incredible experience and jumped into one of the cork expedition zodiacs the penguin <laughs> did trying to get away from the orca wow. so you never know what you're gonna get no. oh wow and so what's neat is these zodiacs are these little rubber boats that we use in the polar regions uh, to get everyone not only to shores, but also use them for great zodiac cruising uh, mm -hmm. experiences. So these are these little rubber boats. They're very stable, very safe. And I always like to say if people can get into a bathtub, uh, that's kind of what it's like getting into a zodiac, just one kind of step in. Mm -hmm. And our expedition team are there to help everyone get in and out of these little rubber boats as well when we're in these regions. So the zodiacs are a fantastic mode of uh, transportation. If someone uh, that's been on an African safari, it's kind of like the Jeep, the safari Jeep is your mode of transportation, let's say in Kenya, going around the Masi Mara. Well, in the polar regions, this zodiac is a great way of, of going around and going on landings and, and being on the lookout for wildlife and scenery. So with the Antarctic Peninsula, a lot of um, companies go to the Antarctic Peninsula because it is a high concentration of wildlife. Mm -hmm. And so this finger of land that's sticking up towards South America is why uh, a lot of trips are in this region or is because of the wildlife. So we have some great 
11, 12 day trips where you can cross the Antarctic, um, go across the Drake Passage to the Antarctic Peninsula mm -hmm. and, uh, and cross back. But then we also have that eight day fly cruise program. So, and it's called Antarctic Express Fly the Drake. So if people do get seasick or they're short on time, it's a great way to fly over to Antarctica, have a wonderful Antarctic experience and fly back. So that's mm -hmm. eight days. Or if people haven't spent a lot of time in South America, a great way of maybe going to um, the uh, Easter Island or doing Iguazu Falls prior or before and, and creating a great uh, South America trip as well in addition to Antarctica. But if people want to spend a bit more time on the peninsula, we do have 14 day trips where you can actually go into the heart of the Antarctic Circle. So crossing mm -hmm. at 66 degrees south. So mm -hmm. this gives a lot of people more time to experience um, the peninsula. Mm -hmm. But then we also have this version as a fly cruise program going as well to the Antarctic Express, but crossing to the um, Antarctic Circle as well. So it's an 11 day fly cruise program that we offer. Yeah. But I can't talk about um, Antarctica without talking about the Falkland Islands in South Georgia. So great sub-Antarctic regions. Uh, and these aren't on a lot of people's radar when Antarctica might be on a lot of people's bucket lists. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Falkland Islands in South Georgia are, are, are kind of really starting to become as popular as Antarctica because South Georgia uh, is known as the Galapagos of the sub-Antarctic region or the Ser Serengeti of the Southern Ocean. So this is um, a great opportunity to put this on people's lists if they're thinking about going to Antarctica to definitely consider exploring uh, South Georgia or the Falkland Islands as well. And so with the Falkland Islands in South Georgia, there's a lot of history, gorgeous scenery. And this is where the home to Sir Ernest Shackleton's grave in South Georgia as well. Mm -hmm. But in these regions, it's the home to the world's largest black-browed albatross colony. So this is a reason, too, to visit some of these uh, sub-Antarctic islands. And you can see in the picture here, it's lush green grass. Mm -hmm. It's just beautiful. So it is still a bit chilly and, and the wind can pick up. And we do recommend everyone wear those uh, parkas. But there are days where the sun's shining and the wind is not uh, blowing. And it can be a lovely experience with your parka tied around your waist and, and seeing the gorgeous wildlife. So the black-browed albatross has the largest wingspan uh, and it's a seven, it can go up to approximately seven and a half feet wide. Mm. And so these birds are remarkable and they actually nest on land, but spend most of their life out on, on the sea. So if you're a birder, definitely put uh, the Falkland Islands as well as South Georgia on your list for places to visit. Mm -hmm. But it's home, uh, South Georgia is actually home to the largest king penguin population. So over 200,000 king penguins. And as I mentioned earlier, there's approximately seven, there's 17 species of penguins in the world, mm -hmm. but this is the second tallest penguin, this king penguin. Mm -hmm. And if you can see the little brown ones there mm -hmm. on, uh, on the screen, uh, those are the adolescent penguins. And so they're not a different species. Uh, naturalists all actually thought they were a completely different species, uh, but they're not. Uh, so that was kind of neat to, that they're the little adolescent uh, juvenile penguins with their adults. It's and this penguin too, Kathleen, mm -hmm. go ahead. Oh, I just thought it was fascinating to see how full that beach is. And it's all just penguins. That's incredible. Wow. Yeah, it's a, it's incredible. It's mm -hmm. just like a, a, a site that would never be seen anywhere else. And the mountain ranges in the background. And so this is South Georgia. And so this, again, is these are species that you wouldn't see in Antarctica. So the king penguin cannot be seen mm -hmm. in Antarctica. So just to mention a couple of voyages with uh, the Falkland Islands and South Georgia. Um, there are 16 day trips to tie in South Georgia with Antarctica, mm -hmm. but then we also have 20 day trips. So if people can get away for a little bit longer, the Falkland, South Georgia and Antarctica trips are fantastic. Way to see a lot in the sub Antarctic region as well. And then we have the epic Antarctica trip 
that's a full 23 days. So it's our longest uh, Antarctic trip. And it not only includes the Falklands in South Georgia, but crossing into 66 degrees south um, and crossing the circle. Mm -hmm. So this is a great, so the 23 day one can be put on people's radar if they can get away for a long period of time. Absolutely, that would be so fascinating. Wow. In Patagonia, I was able to explore a little bit before and after my trip. Um, to Antarctica. But we now actually have trips that are designated uh, Patagonia voyages, so essential Patagonia trips, mm -hmm. or some that actually go to Antarctica and then have a few days in Patagonia on the way back. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just a remarkable way of seeing a bit of Patagonia if people don't want to do uh, hikes and a land-based program. There's actually lots of options for people to uh, sail the Beagle Channel and explore areas of this region like Terra de Fuego uh, by ship. Mm -hmm. And we have two helicopters on our brand new ultramarine vessel, which I'll share with you in a moment. Mm -hmm. But um, people can actually land in Patagonia and go to Cape Horn and visit some incredible historical sites in addition to wildlife. Mm -hmm. And so there's also sea lions and magellic penguins in Patagonia. So the aerial views of Patagonia by helicopter, not just by sea, are going to be out incredible, out of this world. These are brand new itineraries that we have with Cork Expeditions. So people want to explore Patagonia in addition to their Antarctic trip. They can absolutely do that. Uh, we have a 13-day Antarctic Explorer. So it not only uh, covers the seventh continent, so the Antarctic continent, but it also includes Cape Horn and Diego Ramirez. And then there's a 15 day essential Patagonia trip, which someone can either add to their Antarctic trip or maybe people that have been actually been to Antarctica before and want to explore more of Patagonia. This is a great opportunity for people to come back. And so now with a little overview of Antarctica, there's so much to talk about with just Antarctica alone, but I want to take everyone now up to the Arctic. So let's go from the bottom of the world and travel up to the Arctic. And I want to chat a little bit about what regions can be found here because about 4 million people live north of the Arctic Circle, mm -hmm. 66 degrees north, and typically in small communities spanning Canada and Greenland, mm -hmm. Finland and Iceland too, and, and Russia. And so some of the most popular Arctic destinations, I don't think people know, Kathleen, how much there is to see and do in the Arctic. I think people just think Arctic and maybe barren or, or what's there to see and do and why would I want to go there? But the Arctic is so beautiful and it's so vast and different. Uh, so there are so many different things to see, whether it's community visits or wildlife opportunities. And so there are just people tend to keep going back to the Arctic once they get a little bit of a polar fever and the polar bug and they go up mm -hmm. to uh, the Arctic, they want to go back because there's so much to see and do. Yeah. And having and so all we go those to different the, itineraries yeah. as well. So you could just, you know, keep going back year after year and, and exploring a whole new area too. So that's awesome. It's so true. It's so true. And our Arctic season picks up really where Antarctica leaves off. So mm -hmm. after our Antarctic season, uh, we move the ships at uh, the beginning of May up to up to the Arctic. So we start in the Arctic from May and go to the beginning of October. Mm -hmm. So it's a really big season too, going to the Arctic. So this is again, why we only do polar travel. We're in these areas for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also can explore the Russian Arctic. So I went to Franz Josef Land, the archipelago of 191 islands, back in 2010. And it was a magical, mystical place. Mm -hmm. And so there's so much to see and do in Russia, in the Russian high Arctic. Mm -hmm. And I feel like people who have maybe done an expedition before in the Arctic go back. Maybe they've done Spitsbergen to see the polar bears or uh, the Canadian high Arctic. Maybe they've done a little bit of the Northwest Passage. And so... We do do Russia Novoya Zimula, Severny Zimula, in addition to Franz Joseph Land. And it's incredible because if, if people have maybe explored Churchill, Manitoba, mm -hmm. or maybe even Norway, uh, Russia definitely should be a place uh, to put on someone's list of even just thinking about exploring because our Russian itineraries can also take people through the Kara Sea, known as the ice cellar uh, of the Arctic. So for an, an incredible and unforgettable ice cap and ice cliffs and mountain ranges. 
people can follow in the footsteps of a lot of different explorers as mm -hmm. well, like Nansen and Barents as well. But it's just spectacular, spectacular scenery as well in these regions. So not only opportunities to see walrus and polar bear, but just the beautiful, stunning glaciers as well. Mm -hmm. But so we go to the Arctic in the heart of the North American summer. So July and, and August uh, okay. is great times to travel there. So we have 16 day trips, our jewels of the Russian Arctic trip for 16 days. But then, of course, if people want to go a little bit longer, uh, we have Franz Joseph Land, Severnia Zimula and Novoya Zimula uh, for a 22 day trip as well. Wow. But Spitsbergen is incredible. Uh, it's usually where people go first. Uh, maybe if people have been on African safari or again, been to the Galapagos or been to Antarctica, mm -hmm. uh, Spitsbergen is known as the realm of the polar bear. And so Svalbard is the actual archipelago of islands uh, off the coast of Norway in the heart of the Arctic Circle. But Spitsbergen is the main island. So I think people might hear Spitsbergen and Svalbard and mm -hmm. they get a little bit confused. And so Spitsbergen is actually the main island of the archipelago of Svalbard. And so it's a great place um, to explore. Spitsbergen is the largest and only permanently populated island of the Svalbard archipelago. And so this is an incredible area to explore. And our trips go out of uh, Longyearbyen. So we fly into Longyearbyen and that's where we actually embark the ship. And Longyearbyen is the most northerly uh, town and there's actually a little pub there too. So a little local pub, it was neat exploring and going to some museums mm -hmm. uh, before getting onto the ship. But it definitely is known as the realm of the polar bear. Uh, but there's so much more uh, with wal walrus and uh, birds. People are birders. It's a great place to see Arctic birds. On my trip to, uh, to Spitsbergen in 2019, it was in June, and I actually saw a male polar bear out on the sea ice hunting. So we were actually interrupted by our lunch and uh, the expedition leader gently came on the loudspeaker and said, you know, everyone, uh, there is a male bear out on the sea ice, gently and quietly make your way out uh, to out on deck to the bow uh, mm -hmm. where we saw this male bear out on the sea ice and he was hunting a bearded seal. Okay. And it lasted, Kathleen, a few hours to the point where I ended up going in and getting a little cup of tea and coming back outside. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, an extraordinary experience. And at the last minute, the polar bear was behind a pressure ridge of ice and was hiding from the, <laughs> from the bearded seal. But at the last minute, the polar bear lunged at the bearded seal Mm -hmm. and charged after this seal and half the ship was going for the seal half the ship was going for the polar bear the tension yeah. was just insurmountable mm -hmm. and the seal ended up getting away okay wow. but it was just again one of those moments that I'll never forget in the polar regions mm -hmm. and uh, anything can happen so pack yes. pack a sense of adventure and there's even a uh, puffins uh, on the west portion of Spitsbergen. So I saw puffins on my trip. And then Kitty Wink Canyon, this canyon on the right hand side mm -hmm. of this picture with all these birds flying around and nesting kitty wakes. I'd never seen anything like it to the point, Kathleen, where I had my mouth open and I was looking, I was in awe. And the ornithologist, the birder that was traveling with us said, close your mouth because you might get a little surprise yeah. in your mouth from all these birds <laughs> flying overhead. I was just thinking that when you said your mouth was <laughs> up and I'm like, oh, please don't tell me you got a surprise for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh goodness. And then also reindeer and whales too. On my last day in Spitsbergen of a 14-day trip, I saw beluga whales. Uh, on some hikes, our expedition guide told us to quiet, um, to be really quiet and have a moment of reflection. And I was able to see a reindeer and I heard the reindeer chewing on, on some grass. So it's just, you never know what you're going to come across on some of the contemplative walks or hikes or zodiac cruises. So we have trips as little as seven days to Spitsbergen. So maybe if someone wants to go, maybe they're exploring in the summer, or they're going to England or they're going to France, a great opportunity to still scoot up to Norway and do uh, a trip and uh, to see the polar bears in Spitsbergen. Mm -hmm. But we also have 10 day trips, 12 day trips, all the way up to 14 day trips. So just seeing what people are wanting to go and see. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have trips though, Aberdeen, Scotland going up to Spitsbergen. 
So uh, if someone wants to dabble a little bit in the polar regions for their first time, great opportunity to see Aberdeen and go up to Fair Isle, Faroe Islands, Yanomayan, and then ending in Spitsbergen. But I wanted to mention Greenland because Greenland was never on my list of places to visit. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely incredible. It's the largest island in the world, home to the largest fjord systems in the world. Mm -hmm. And I went to the east portion of Greenland back in 2016. This is where I saw the northern lights. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I have to go back to Greenland. I need to go to the south and the west because they're all so different. It's yeah. amazing that being the largest island on the planet, there's so mm -hmm. much diversity. So in West Greenland, there's fjords and glaciers and archaeological sites are definitely the order of the day. Mm -hmm. Akipsermia is a massive glacier which regularly calves massive ice chunks into the Atlantic Ocean as well. And so a lot of the icebergs that are, are seen in the Atlantic Ocean are coming from this portion of, of Greenland, which I didn't realize until our glaciologist was sharing this with me on, on board and, and giving one of the educational uh, seminars. Mm -hmm. But in South Greenland, Viking history, I just love history uh, when I'm on a trip and a historian's mm -hmm. explaining to me what I'm seeing, maybe the Thule uh, remains uh, or the actual Viking history as well. So I just, South Greenland is rich uh, with history. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Oh. But with our helicopters now, we get aerial views. Mm -hmm. So little helicopter flight sightseeing excursions are included with our ultramarine trip where we have two helicopters so the beauty of greenland is just fascinating the mountain ranges and little glacial lakes and glaciers in and of itself so we can actually even do heli landings and heli hiking in in greenland if someone would like uh, but i love even just the aerial flight sightseeing tours uh, to see the glacier from the sea from the ship from sea level but then also having that uh, aerial view of a glacier as well getting both perspectives so East Greenland's great for hiking. If people are hiking, hikers or kayakers, highly recommend going to Greenland. Mm -hmm. It's nice too having Greenland uh, hiking experiences and going out for the day, but then coming back to the comfort of the uh, luxurious vessel with food, great meals on board, and then going out for another excursion the next day. So there's just so much to explore in Greenland. And there are definitely our Greenland Northern Lights. So I was on uh, a trip where by the fourth night, I stopped wanting to see them in September of 2016, because I was getting up at one in the morning <laughs> to see them yeah. going out in my pajama bottoms. Um, and uh, I just wanted to get up some of the early morning zodiac cruises so we saw them quite a bit and so it is weather permitting but uh in the eight years or so we've been doing this trip uh we haven't uh had an experience where we haven't seen the northern lights yet so again end of august beginning of september through to beginning of october great opportunities to see the northern lights in greenland i'm certain I'd but we go to thing. Yeah. i'd make sure i'm out there and i got my you know extra sd cards just to get those images just properly on the the big camera right oh so gorgeous yeah yeah are you a photographer uh i i don't call myself a photographer but i do love taking pictures and getting the right composition in my pictures but uh, whether oh, they're, that's they're worthy amazing. of being called a photographer or not i don't think so but uh <laughs> They're, they're good for us anyway. No, I think that's great. I, I think that makes you a photographer indeed. I think that's incredible. I just take my little point and shoot camera from or my uh, phone camera phone. So I love that you were you were sharing about how you would actually take pictures of the Northern Lights. I think that's yeah, incredible. I definitely use the DSLR for that because you want to catch every nuance of the colors and make sure they're vivid as well. But you know, phones have come a long way uh, than yeah. they have. And I, you know, if somebody just has a, a phone that's probably going to take a great photo too yeah yeah and there's a photographer on board each of our trips too so no matter if someone's a really experienced photographer or someone that's just introduced themselves to photography there's great uh, expedition team member that's a photographer on every trip too oh that's fabulous because then they can give hints and and to help you with yeah that. amazing yeah that's great and Greenland can be explored in July, starting in July with that uh, Greenland adventure program, exploring mm -hmm. South Greenland for little as nine days. But then we go in, uh, in August and, and September as well to Greenland. So, so much to explore. So we have nine day trips to Greenland, um, flying from, uh, 
Iceland, so from Reykjavik over to Nursasawak. But then we also have great West Greenland trips in South Greenland for 15 days. So just depending on uh, how long someone can go for where we start in Reykjavik, cruise over the Denmark Strait, mm. explore South Greenland and West Greenland, and then fly back to Iceland from Kangerlussuaq. So just depending on how long people want to go for. But the last thing that I wanted to mention is the Canadian mm -hmm. Arctic. And we do have great Northwest Passage trips that are as little as nine days up to 17 days mm -hmm. of, of the Canadian Arctic. Mm -hmm. So people can who are wanting to seek new experiences and the vastness of Canada. It's just gorgeous glacier top mountains and jagged coastlines too in, in the Canadian Arctic. So people can follow in the footsteps of legendary explorers, but also we're always on the lookout for wildlife. And whether we're in the Antarctic or the Arctic, we have an incredible team of expedition team members. And we're 24 hours a day on the bridge looking for out for wildlife and experiences so if we do see something at one or two in the morning we will gently wake people up uh, if there, there was a polar bear sighting with her two cubs mm -hmm. at about three in the morning and everyone was gently w woken up and if people wanted to sleep in it's everyone's vacation so they can do yeah. what they like mm -hmm. but we're always on uh, the lookout for wildlife and the Canadian Arctic it's not only for whales polar bears possibilities of uh, beluga whales um bow-headed whales and potentially even narwhals that we're always on the lookout for narwhals that unicorn of the sea that's for sure yeah that's uh, so but it's wow. yeah so this is definitely a place that people should put on their radar i mean uh, i live in canada we are an american-based company in seattle but i live in canada and i just have loved traveling um in canada during this time and so we have flights that go from toronto up to resolute and then everyone gets on the ship in resolute uh, and then flies back to Toronto. So great opportunities to explore the Canadian Arctic. Um, even going into uh, community visits uh, like Arctic Bay. Uh, and so it's just a wonderful way to explore the Canadian Arctic. And again, with the helicopters, we're able to go further and farther into these regions. So we're exploring in August and September, the Canadian Arctic. Beautiful. So trips again, little as nine days with the Arctic Express Canada, the heart of the Northwest Passage. Mm -hmm. And Canada's remote Arctic. If people want to go further north to Axel Heiberg and Ellesmere Island, we have a great 12-day trip as well. And what I love about this is it's great for traditional cruisers, but also people who aren't cruisers and uh, love going out off the ship as much as possible and hike and be active and explore. It's great because we're maneuvering around these islands. So during the evening is when we're positioning and at night was when we're positioning the ship. So there's not actual full sea days on this nine and 12 day itineraries, which mm -hmm. is a great point. But then of course, if people are wanting those um, days to explore Greenland as well, in addition to the Canadian High Arctic, we do Northwest Passage trips, an epic High Arctic trip, mm -hmm. 17 days. And a Northwest Pass trip, trip that's the east portion of Baffin Island, uh, but then also ends in Kangarooseawak. So just gorgeous areas to explore. And we used to have 30-day trips, 20, 25 day trips of the Northwest Passage, but a lot of our guest feedback was it was lovely and amazing, but it was so long with so many sea days. So it's great with our new vessel, the Ultramarine, we're able to keep her up in the Arctic and have her do smaller and shorter ship trips, 9, 12 and 17 days. But now that I've t covered a little bit of the of the polar regions, a little bit of the Arctic and a little bit of the Antarctic, because there's so much to, I could do just one uh, great uh, <laughs> conversation with you on Greenland alone. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to mention our off ship experience because mm -hmm. Cork Expeditions does offer the largest portfolio of off ship adventure options. So if people are looking to go further and farther. It's definitely what we specialize in. So we get everyone a bit closer into nature with our expert guides and innovative itineraries and these quick deploying zodiacs that I was mentioning that enable spontaneous and up close wildlife encounters never before imagined. We do offer these adventure options. And so unlike traditional cruise companies, Cork Expeditions does focus on off ship adventure. We offer more ways to explore the polar regions than anyone else with our heli hiking and we even have stand up paddle boarding in Antarctica. And so we have a great robust portfolio of adventure options. Absolutely. Again, it can be as active and as leisure as you want your trip to be, mm -hmm. but we have lots included. 
So we have the Zodiac cruising, the hiking in Greenland, the uh, Greenland Adventure Program. We even have walking on the Greenland ice sheet included and the infamous polar plunge we have on every trip. <laughs> would you do a polar plunge, Kathleen? Um, no, Pack I don't your bathing think suit I just would, in case. but my husband likes to do the, uh, the polar bear swim. So every New Year's Day, he just jumps into Lake Ontario and does that. I'm not quite that. I don't want to say insane, but it's just not for me, <laughs> but uh, he would definitely do it. I would stand there and take the pictures and, and just do that one. But uh, yeah, he'd do jumping right in. Well, people have just as much fun watching from the comforts of the vessel <laughs> while everyone does participate. So it's great entertainment. Did you, did you actually jump in? I did. I did. I did it in Harefjord in Greenland. And I also did it in the Arctic Ocean on the North Pole trip at 90 degrees north. Uh, but it is exhilarating. It's definitely um, a once in a lifetime on. experience. I haven't done it on every one of my trips. Mm -hmm. I will admit that. Yeah. <laughs> I liked my little shot of vodka, though, after getting out to warm me up. See, you got to warm up <laughs> on the inside. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I put on my slippers and my house coat, and I headed to the sauna right after on board, because uh, that uh, definitely warmed me up as well. Yeah, smart. But we have lots of additional adventure options mm -hmm. that are paid, so there's lots included. But if people do want that extra elevated added sense of exploration and adventure, we have a kayaking program where we have actual sea kayaks and guides that uh, can go out with people for as many times as possible so the guests can explore an actual sea kayak. But we also have the inflatable kayaks, so if guests aren't uh, comfortable, we have a, uh, a basically a paddling excursion for one time for an hour and a half people can mm -hmm. maneuver around icebergs in a really stable inflatable kayak if people want that mm -hmm. uh, we also have heli landings and in Greenland we have uh, a fantastic mountain biking excursion uh, we have stand-up paddle boarding in Antarctica and what I loved about this is one of our paddle boarding guides from uh, Tofino actually from the west coast of British Columbia mm -hmm. um, he said that approximately 70 percent of the guests that were participating in stand-up paddle boarding in Antarctica had never stand-up paddle boarded in their lives and they chose to do it in yeah. Antarctica yes I mean think about the memories of doing that because that's not something that you know you typically think about when you're going on a cruise ship is to go paddle boarding in, in Antarctica so why not that's amazing and that is a highlight of our voyages is our expedition team. So I, I mentioned our, one of our stand-up paddleboarding guides and our kayaking guides. And uh, But there are incredible expedition team members that work for Cork Expeditions. We have ornithologists, glaciologists, geologists. We even have a penguinologist that comes with us to Antarctica. <laughs> And so well, I really do. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And if I knew that I could be a penguinologist when I was in high school and things may have changed, I cannot believe that that is a career. Yeah. Uh, how exciting is it that people can research uh, pe uh, penguins? I love mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. But we do have um, the most experienced team in the polar industry after 30 years of polar adventure, our seasoned guides and expedition team and uh, polar specialists have endless passion and unparalleled knowledge to share with all of our guests on board. And we have a really high ratio of staff to guests, which means a, a real personal experience. So we have one expedition team member to seven passengers on board. And what I love about our expedition two, uh, team too is that they sit with our guests during dinners and lunches. And I really feel like people come back and share with their advisors, this was the one of the best parts of my trip is chatting with the expedition team and hearing about their experiences and their research uh, while I was on board. So it's a real incredible experience being able to be even out on deck and seeing something and an expedition team member coming along and saying, oh, that was a leopard seal. Did you see that out on the sea ice? And so it's a real immersive exper educational experience mm -hmm. too for people. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And so our fleet, so we have a ship of five fleets, uh, we have a fleet of five ships, but I'll mm -hmm. mention just a few here are new ultramarine, a polar game changer. So at three decades now of polar experience, I love the fact that we have our brand new ship, the ultramarine. She's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, she was built in Croatia, something really fantastic. Great news over the past these 18 months. Um, she actually means beyond the sea. So in Latin, ultramarine means beyond the sea. So she has 199 passengers and 
and is designed specifically for uh, polar exploration. So she features two helicopter pads, four quick Zodiac uh, embarkation points. Mm -hmm. So we can even launch the Zodiacs even faster on this ship, getting everyone off, uh, off the ship as quickly as possible. And so the Ultramarine is truly a game changer in polar travel. Mm -hmm. wow. And I just love the fact that with her being a new vessel, we were able to build four Zodiac disembarkation points. So two are right even on the stern. Mm -hmm. So Kathleen, if people are thinking this isn't for them and there might be it's too adventurous and getting off the ship might be a little bit um, too much for them, just the, the, the actual platform at the stern is great for getting in and out the Zodiacs. So there is a little something for everyone for mm -hmm. a polar expedition. That's mm -hmm. for sure. Very stable. We've got a great, see that. that's great. Yeah. And we've got a great spawn board, a mud room, mm -hmm. and we, all of our cabins are outdoor cabin, outside cabins. We even have solo panoramic uh, cabins on this ship as well. So if people are solo travelers, they can all, all also meet like-minded individuals um, while traveling in the polar regions. We've got a great gym. We also, uh, so expedition doesn't mean, <laughs> you know, um, sacrificing those creature comforts oh, uh, people no can still have here. great yeah. food and great mm -hmm. dining experiences on board mm -hmm. and so this is our actual explorer suite our introductory cabin for um for uh double occupancy so this is a great explorer suite beautiful and in Antarctica, we also have our World Explorer, our luxurious all balcony, all suite vessel mm -hmm. so lots to choose from she's got also a fitness center and spa on board uh, great cabins. It's a veranda suite. Mm -hmm. So just because people are going on an expedition doesn't mean they can't have luxurious accommodations right. as well. So great opportunities for lovely cabins. And this is our ocean adventurer, our 128 passenger vessel. Mm -hmm. uh, she was renovated in 2017. She had a multi-million dollar renovation. Uh, she has traditional mahogany and brass decor and is a great expedition vessel. Uh, there aren't any balcony suites on this voyage, but there are great suites and, and twin cabins. So just depending on, on someone's level of, of comfort, uh, this mm -hmm. is a great little expedition ship. Then we also have the Ocean Diamond. She's known as a super yacht. She is a favorite vessel among uh, past passengers too for Antarctica. Mm -hmm. So she inspires a friendly onboard community with a variety of lounges and bars and, and lecture rooms as well. So she's a great expedition ship in, in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. So just before we wrap up, sustainability has been a part of our DNA. And I wanted to mention that in 2019, we did launch our Polar Promise so we did unveil our sustainability strategy under the a banner of the Polar Promise. So really, at the end of the day, we created our Polar Ambassador Program because we want guests um, to become Polar Ambassadors and take home with them the sustainability lessons that they learned on board uh, going into the Arctic and Antarctica with us. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately, it is about preserving the polar regions so that our next generation of polar travelers um can they enjoy. can be preserved yeah Amazing. so that is indeed our polar promise mm -hmm. and we do have our safe certified um covid policy that have come out mm -hmm. so please uh, reach out if anyone has more questions about that uh, we are an industry leader in health and safety uh, cork expeditions is the only polar specialist with an externally accredited safety program Mm -hmm. And so health and safety has been number one for us uh, for uh, 30 years. But the challenges of COVID-19 have reinforced our commitment to guest safety. So we did come up out with our um, safe uh, program. So for um, science-led safety protocols and anytime cancellation and rebooking. Also, polar regions are free from crowds naturally. So this mm -hmm. is a great opportunity to start exploring the polar regions. And then also the E stands for the experience will not be compromised. Um, so we do have mandatory uh, vaccinations for all guests. So if, mm -hmm. if people are coming on board this upcoming Antarctic season, we do um, have mandatory vaccinations also for our guests and crew as well. So please, mm -hmm. if there's... Um, any more questions on that, Kathleen, please feel free to reach out. But I did want to mention mention that so that people can explore the polar regions with uh, peace of mind Wonderful. from booking to boarding. Amazing. So thank you so much for your time. I 
love that I'm here giving an overview of a bit of what Cork Expeditions does in the polar regions. Uh, and there's just so much to talk about. And I get so excited about uh, traveling and exploring the polar region. So I really appreciate you having me today. Oh, I thank you for coming on and for putting all that together. That was a lot of work to put it together and I greatly appreciate it. I love the overview, not only of the ships, but of the itineraries and what you're going to find there. So that, thank you again. I really appreciate that. So I hope everybody has a great week and we'll see everybody next week. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you so much for watching this week's cruise chat with Kara from Cork. It was so nice to see some of their itineraries to get a sneak peek at their ships. I really enjoyed meeting with her for the first time. And it was really, really nice to see that brand overview. I especially loved hearing the memories that she had of the experiences in terms of the whales and all the other stories that she told. And I just know that when you get a chance to go, you will have so many long lasting memories as well, which is just fabulous when you're cruising with your family or your loved ones. And uh, it's just so nice to make those memories and to get out there. Next week, I'm going to be meeting with Windstar Cruises. It's again going to be the first time that we meet. So we're going to be doing a brand overview as well. So make sure you tune in next week to catch that. Also, I'm on Facebook and Instagram and we post every single day. So if you would like to see some of the posts that we have there or some of the content that's there, feel free to check out our pages. And also you can reach me on my website or Kathleen at plenty of as well. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a wonderful week. I'll see you next week. Goodbye.